think we're all all about here. It's a nice crowd tonight. Thank you all for turning out. Uh, my name is Bill Cavers. I'm with the Darien Coastal Commission, um, otherwise as a longer name of uh, Darien, Darien Advisory Commission on Coastal Waters. If you look it up on the town website, you'll find it under that longer name. Um, anyway, it's a pleasure to uh, co-host this event um, for the discussion of the Connecticut Blue Plan uh, being hosted by uh, Connecticut Deep and uh, the Nature Conservancy, which is uh, uh, the outreach uh, contractor for Connecticut Deep on this. Um, and I thought I would just take a minute or two, if you don't mind me here, to set the stage and then hand it over to your two able presenters. Um, so I'm on the Coastal Commission, and uh, just a word of what we do on the Coastal Commission. We are an advisory group for the Darien uh, Board of Selectmen. We're sort of an informal harbor commission. We're not a formal, a formal organization, but serve in an advisory capacity. And that has us do a number of tasks, um, all boating and coastal related uh, for the uh, town. Um, but I, what I wanted to emphasize right now, there are, are two um, strong things we see in almost every task we do. Um, and some of these play out uh, uh, quite uh, strongly in, in the um, types of actions and things that we have to undertake and things we have to, um, uh, people we have to listen to. And, and the first is that anything we do involves a multiplicity of stakeholders. Anything involved in the water seems to be very complicated. I don't quite know why that is, but um, it, it's apparent in, in the slightest task we pick up that there are uh, people of different opinions. They, they are boaters, and not all boaters are equal. There are uh, motor boaters, there are um, sailboaters, racing sailboaters, cruising sailboaters, kayakers, stand-up paddle boarders, and they all have different opinions on their equality. Um, there are uh, commercial fishermen, um, like we have uh, Mr. Freight here. Um, there are also uh, uh, public um, uh, uh, shell fishermen. I'm sorry, fishermen, shellfish is the better term. Um, and so we have public clamming beds. Um, there are also um, obviously landowners and the function of landowners really can differ some are really concerned about their vista some are concerned about the long docks they're building into the water and we accommodate those and, and review the plans along with deep and some of them like all of us are concerned about green lawns and all the fertilizer we use on green lawns goes into the water and can really affect shellfish and and in the past has affected probably lobster so um, there's uh, quite a lot of um, Stakeholders all raising their hand at the same time on any given issue, and that's just apparent from the start on anything with water. The second thing that we've been observing, and it's really amazing also, is how dynamic the environment is. You know, the coast you sort of think just sits there forever the same. Well, there's some big obvious things, rising sea levels, right? That's just huge in our area, and the plus 10, 11 feet on the house foundations now speaks to its um, importance these days. But also there's the climate change and the increased frequency of storms. Um, there are also uh, um, uh, things, for example, uh, the sea barriers that are proposed for being built down by the, uh, in various parts of New York Harbor, including at the Throgs Neck Bridge, that would affect the types of tides and current and the tidal rises and currents that we see in our area. Um, so that's potentially quite dramatic. And then if you go further out east in the state, there's a lot of potential effect um, from uh, wind farms. So maybe not right off Stonington, but off Block Island, and a lot of industry that's being built off that that will go off to Massachusetts uh, coast and, and other parts of Long Island. Um, so that's quite dramatic. We're not seeing those types of farms in our area. We're a light, uh, winded area. Um, but we are seeing different types of farms. We've had applications for oyster um, farms in our um, uh, territorial waters, if you will, our coastal Darien waters. There's an oyster farm that's got a lot of buoys in the water, which is right off Stanford, um, uh, uh, Stanford um, Shippen Point, excuse me. Um, there's also kelp farms. So there's a kelp farm off of Sheffield Island. That's got a lot of buoys in the water. So um, there are these uh, trends sweeping through um, our environment, which are, which are showing the environment doesn't stay static. And so uh, anything you do, you're going to have a lot of stakeholders involved when it comes to coastal matters. And you're going to have a lot of um, varying um, environmental factors. And the pace of change with the environmental factors is creating a lot of tension with all the multiplicity of users. And so what this all points to um, is that um, 
we, we've got a toolbox right now for handling planning and zoning matters on the coast and in the waters, but that toolbox can't sit still. It, it's got to constantly upgrade. And that's where uh, we as a town really applaud the goals of the Connecticut Blue Plan. It's trying to upgrade that toolbox, that planning and zoning uh, tool for coastal matters. Um, and, uh, and, and we think that's the right thing to do. Also the right thing to do is the manner in which they're going about it, and that's why we've all gathered here tonight, is to review their plan and to provide comment on it. And that's really important because these guys can't, they know a lot about the water and the coast, but they don't necessarily know our waters and how we view it and all our multiplicity, uh, multiplicity of uses of the water. And we need to let them know, does their plan embrace the uses as we see fit? And so we've um, wanted to co-sponsor this event to gather that opinion and allow it to be fed into the Connecticut Blue Plan and hopefully we'll make a better product. Uh, and I understand the product is going to be delivered to the state legislature at the beginning of this coming year? Correct. Yeah. So that's sort of the time frame we're looking at, and I'd urge you all to um, listen to what they have to say and input where you think they could improve things. So um, that was all I wanted to say, and I'll let them introduce themselves further, but we've got uh, Emily Hall from Connecticut Deep and Christian Fox from the Nature Conservancy, and I think you're in good hands listening to their presentation. All right, thank you so much, Bill. Um, I don't think anyone has ever set the stage as well as that before, that was fantastic. Um, also, thank you to the library for hosting us here, uh, the wonderful technical staff for helping make this the probably smoothest setup that we've had in one of these meetings so far, too. So, much obliged. Um, we also have TV sem channel 79 back here filming. Thank you very much to John back there. Um, and a couple other housekeeping notes before we begin. We've got some materials over here you guys are free to take. Uh, after the presentation, we've got some, some basic information about the blue plans, basic information about the document itself, what's contained in there. Uh, we also have a sign-up sheet. So if you want to be on the listserv or you just want us to know that you were here, please sign in. That's extraordinarily helpful to us. Um, we also have a couple public comment forms. So if you, you feel you want to make a public comment, official comment on the blue plan tonight, please feel free to fill one of these out. Um, DEEP will take that back and, and incorporate that as part of the, the planning process. And lastly, we have a researcher here from Southern Connecticut State University, Michaela, sitting in the back, um, who's conducting a survey on the, the public engagement process associated with the Blue Plan. And I understand that she has a couple surveys that she's also handing out or capable of handing out. So if you want to talk with her, uh, feel free. Um, once again, thank you so much. My name is Christian Fox. I'm here from the Nature Conservancy. I am the outreach coordinator with the Blue Plan process. Um, we also have the majority of the rest of the team here with us tonight. Uh, we have Mary Beth Hart from Deep, David Blatt from Deep, Emily Hall, who wears a few hats, but also of Deep, um, Kevin O'Brien of Deep, Sylvain DeGuise of Connecticut Sea Grant, and my boss, Nathan Froling of the Nature Conservancy. Um, Nathan and Sylvain are both on the Blue Plan Advisory Committee as well, so you'll hear a little bit more about that in a short while. Um, all right, so to begin, the Blue Plan does not really exist in a vacuum. The Blue Plan is a marine spatial plan, which is part of a, a pedagogy, if you will, of new policy tools that are being used throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, uh, Rhode Island has one, Massachusetts has one, they've got a couple over on the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, and we also have a few regionally that encompass a few states here on the, on the East Coast, in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. Um, so the Blue Plan is, is learning from these, from some of the efforts they've made, in some cases some of the mistakes, in some cases some of the really great, clever things they've done. Um, Ocean plans like this all have one thing in common. They're all kind of distributed governance built upon the, the knowledge base of the people who use the area and bring that in to, to make better decisions where before there really wasn't a whole lot of capacity for that. Um, so one of the ways we've gone about explaining this and introducing people who don't know all of Long Island Sound very well, maybe they know one part extraordinarily well but not the whole sound overall, um, is we created a video series in partnership with Middlesex Community College. Um, 
their film department up there is absolutely astounding in their capacity for, for shooting and editing great videos. So we put together an, a series of interviews uh, talking with the folks who are, are out on Long End Sound, who know it, who currently help manage it. Um, and we also did a, uh, an episode on the environments of Long Island Sound, all the, all the unique critters that we have out there and the unique environments that we really want to protect with this plan as well. So this is divided into six episodes, um, one of which is the introduction, which I figured we would show right now, just to give you guys a flavor, not only for the series, but also building on, on Bill's introduction to the Blue Plan, giving a little bit more of the, of the why and the need for this thing before we delve into the rest of the presentation. Long Island Sound, Connecticut's largest and most important natural resource. More than 23 million people live within 50 miles of its shores. Activities that take place on and along the Sound, such as boating, fishing, tourism, and swimming, contribute an estimated $5.5 billion per year to the region's economy. Its ports and harbors have long played a vital role in transporting people, goods, and energy. Long Island Sound is one of the region's most vibrant marine ecosystems and covers more than 1,000 square miles. It's an important feeding, breeding, and nesting area for fish, crustaceans, birds, mammals, and more. Over the last three decades, Connecticut has made a significant commitment to protecting and restoring the Sound. Plans and programs are now in place to address water quality and coastal development, but there has been no way to comprehensively assess potential uses of the Sound. Agencies such as the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection were evaluating each project proposal on a case-by-case -case basis without the ability to consider what was best for the Sound as a whole. To address this issue, Connecticut passed legislation in 2015 calling for the creation of the Long Island Sound Blue Plan. The focus of this science-based marine spatial plan is from the 10-foot depth contour waterward, so not as to conflict with existing coastal management. The first task in developing the Blue Plan was inventorying the Sound's existing human uses as well as its habitats and natural features. The inventory was then used to develop a series of detailed maps. The goals of the Blue Plan are to protect the Sound's traditional uses along with its ecosystem while minimizing conflict with potential new uses. The Blue Plan will not create new regulations. It was designed to be a tool that will help with the decision-making process. Both the inventory and the Blue Plan are required to be reviewed and updated at least once every five years and will have a public hearing annually. An advisory committee representing different interests in Long Island Sound has been assisting with the development of the Blue Plan. Stakeholders and the general public have had a number of options for sharing information and input. If you would like to share your comments and concerns, please visit our website for more information. All right. So I know that was kind of like drinking from a fire hose at points, but we're going to delve into all of that and unpack it a little bit more as we go. So first and foremost, what is the Blue Plan? What is this thing we're putting together? Well, it's a, it's a marine spatial plan that, as Bill said, will help us better, better plan and better guide new uses of Connecticut's waters and submerged lands. Um, and this thing, when it's complete, will live within Connecticut's coast, existing Coastal Management Act Coastal Management Policies, um, but it won't apply just to the, to the programs that the Coastal Management Policies currently apply to. There are a few more that will actually um, be relevant to. Uh, again, Emily will get into those a little bit later, but just as a primer, know that that's where it will live, within Connecticut's existing Coastal Management jurisdiction. Um, being a marine spatial plan, this thing is, is really two, two facets. The first is a knowledge base as to what's out there in the sound, what matters? What do we want to care about? Those are all those stakeholders that Bill was talking about earlier. Those are all the environments and unique places in the sound that we know and want to recognize. Um, the flip side of that, the, flip side, the other facet, is the policies that represent those places, um, policies that are applied in each one of those, 
um, but also policies that are applied sound-wide to help sustain those things that we care about in the sound. Um, as you heard Judy say in the film, the Blue Plan is not a new regulatory program or, or a new burden you'll, anyone will ever have to go through to get a permit. There's, there, you know, in addition to getting uh, structures and fill permit, you'll never have to also get a Blue Plan permit. This whole thing exists within the existing regulatory structure that we have in Connecticut now, and we would have with or without a Blue Plan in place. Well, if that's the case, you know, if this thing will exist within the re existing regulatory structure we have, why do we need it? Well, because of stuff like this, because of, you know, the possibility of bridges, the possibility of large offshore LNG platforms that would really change the way we were able to interact with the sound, that would really impact the uses of the sound, um, and have the potential to really denigrate the sound, both in terms of uses that we care about, um, whether from recreation or fishing or commerce, um, but also the natural setting that's out there as well. I'm sure everyone here remembers Broadwater, large LNG platform actually on the New York side of the sound, but still would have really, really changed the way people were able to access and view, literally just see, um, the center of Long Island Sound. It was plopped down right there. So this is really an attempt to get out ahead of that and to have a, a comprehensive management plan that lays out our collective view for how we want to see Long Island Sound in the future. So we have three goals that have really guided us in all this as we're putting this together. The first is to identify and protect places of ecological significance. And we'll get into some of these a little bit later, but for now, just know, identify and protect places of ecological significance. The second, um, paired with that, is identify and protect places of traditional human use. That's things like commercial fishing, recreational boating, aquaculture, stuff that's been going on in the Sound for a long time, and we all depend on, and we all value, and in many cases, why we live here. And again, we'll get into what some of these are a little bit later on. The third goal that we're working with, and trying to sustain this whole process, is to reduce conflict between new uses and existing uses. And when I say new uses, I don't mean um, going in and doing the maintenance dredging on a channel that's, that's been there for 100 years or longer. I mean something like a, a cross-sound cable that hasn't existed in a certain geography before, something like a, a seaweed farm that hasn't existed in a geography before, which, well, it might be a very good thing to have economically and ecologically, um, you really want to make sure that's sited well and located well and not causing conflict. And so that's the whole purpose of the Blue Plan. So to put that in a little bit of a visual representation, what we're working on doing is first identifying these existing use and ecological areas and then coming up with policies that say, you know, maybe, maybe a certain use is compatible with these and, and fine to share geography with them. And maybe a certain use would be better off if it avoided those or had certain siting and performance standards that it had to adhere to and helped reduce conflict with those areas that it might encounter. And again, Emily will unpack this a little bit more later in the program, but just to, just to set the stage, get you to thinking about this, what we've been working with in this whole process is to identify these areas and come up with the specific policies that will protect them or represent them and sustain them. Looking at the logistics of this thing a little bit, the whole Blue Plan process is led by the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, um, and that's a legislative mandate. So in 2015, the legislature voted to have this happen, to go through a Blue Plan process and handed it to DEEP to go through the thing. Um, DEEP is guided by a 16-member advisory committee, and that's made up of members of different state agencies, DOT, Bureau of Aquaculture, as well as numerous stakeholders. Um, representing fishing, representing sailing, representing recreation, and representing conservation. Um, totaling 16 folks in all, including the Commissioner of Deep. Um, because the Long Island Sound is a shared water body between Connecticut and New York, this whole process has been coordinated with our buddies across the pond in Long Island as much as possible. Um, when we talk about the plan, we talk about having two overall boundaries. The first is a planning boundary, which you can see represented here. You can think of that as the, uh, the high water mark, basically anything Long Island Sound gets wet. And this is where we just want to collect information from, just understand 
what's out there, what are we working with, what do we know about Long Island Sound. The second, if we zoom in on this geography down here, zoom in a little bit on Western Sound, you can see the difference between the planning area, where we're con collecting all that information from and trying to understand really well, and the policy area, where those, those specific and sound-wide policies um, will apply. So to zoom in a little bit more on our area right here, you can see the distinction between those areas really well. So you can see the planning area hugging the coastline, and you can see the policy area standing a little bit further offshore. Now where that line is, is designated by the legislature. It was set at a, um, the contour line, which represents 10 foot depth or deeper. Um, and so that's not, not 10 feet deep on a nautical chart, it's actually 10 feet on a different datum. And so it doesn't vary with the tide, it doesn't change. Um, but the whole point is that it's further offshore, in some cases many hundreds of feet, in some cases a little bit closer in. But the idea is to not overlap with existing coastal management programs that are already in place, or overlap with existing harbor management plans that a municipality may have, um, such as Darien. And again, I think we're going to discuss this a little bit more later, too. But just the take-home point for right now is to understand that the, the policies of the Blue Plan, where this thing really has impacts, is a little bit further offshore from where most of us interact when we go down to the coast. So the process we've been working with was first to gather the data within that planning area to, to see what was out there, what existing data sets exist, what published knowledge is available, uh, publicly accessible, easily downloadable, and representative of all of Long Island Sound as opposed to just discrete pockets here or there where there's very intensive knowledge, but no, no representation of the stuff around it. Um, all that information was assembled into an inventory of natural resources and human uses of Long Island Sound, which you guys may have seen out there. It was published in early 2018 um, for, uh, for a review. Since that time, we've been working from the inventory, from the information in the inventory, to identify those important human use and ecological areas, and to form the policies and siting and performance standards that represent and sustain them within the Blue Plan itself. And those identified areas and those associated policies together become the Blue Plan. So this is the cover of the inventory. If you've seen it out there, you recognize it. Um, it's, a, it's a beefy document. It's about 330 pages. Numerous chapters, um, each examining different sectors of use. So that could be shipping, that could be waterfowl hunting. That's all, all the things that happen in Long Island Sound. And also the ecological areas that are out there, the, the ecological characterization, we would say, of Long Island Sound. Um, and one thing that's, that's good to have about the inventory is just kind of a, uh, a, a point, a justification of why each of those things is important to Long Island Sound, culturally and economically and ecologically, why we care about knowing where those are and what they are. So the process we've been going through for most of the last year has been working from that inventory to identify the special areas. And remember in this, we were guided by two goals. Identify and protect the ecologically significant areas and the places of traditional human use, or the significant human use areas. Now I'm going to slip into a little bit of blue plan jargon here for the rest of the presentation. We'll talk about the ESAs as being the ecologically significant areas and the SHUAs or the SHUAs as being the significant human use areas. Um, for each of these, even though we map them and we have spatial maps of where we understand they exist now throughout the sound, um, it's the written definition, the written criteria that represent them in the document that really matter to policy. Because, again, as Bill was saying, our sound is an incredibly dynamic spot. And what's true from one year may not be true to the other year or may not be true in 10 years. And so we need the plan to remain adaptable to these changing conditions. And so by defining what makes something an important recreational fishing area or what makes something an important recreational boating area or important shipping area and not tying us to a certain data set or a certain map, we've allowed the plan to remain flexible but still provide the protections that are needed for these areas in the planning process. This graphic just kind of shows how that's worked, um, how it wasn't a, a single linear process to move from having a spatial data set to having policies, how we needed to know how we wanted to define what made up a significant area based on 
the data that we had available and based on the policies we thought could be applicable to that. So to give you an even better idea of what this looks like, let's look at recreational boating. Um, we all know that recreational boating happens everywhere in the Sound. I don't think there's any square inch of water you could go on in Long Island Sound that hasn't been touched by a boat in the last year. But we also all know that there are areas in the Sound that see a lot more boating than other areas. So we were able to work from a data set that exists from the Northeast Ocean Data Portal, the Northeast Regional Marine Spatial Plan, um, that says, sound-wide, this is where we know boating happens. This is based on a, uh, a survey that was conducted in 2012. Again, all the information we're working with is the best available data. Doesn't necessarily mean it's as recent as we would like it to be. Doesn't necessarily mean it's as comprehensive as we would like it to be. But it's the best that's out there representing all of Long Island Sound. So in this case, we were able to look at this data, have it all quantified spatially throughout the sound, and be able to pull out the areas that are above average density, see more boats per year on average than areas next to them. And so we were able to go from that map that kind of covers the whole sound to the map that shows where boating is really important, really highlights the routes. And I think we would all agree with that. I think we would all agree that there's a lot of traffic over going through the Plum Gut, that there's a lot of traffic that goes between Bridgeport and Port Jeff. And this is really a fairly realistic representation of where recreational boaters go. We applied a very similar process to commercial shipping. Um, if people here are familiar with AIS, or Automatic Identification System, that a lot of commercial vessels and some larger recreational vessels have on them, um, we were able to harvest that data that NOAA publishes, and this comes out much more frequently than that recreational boater data, um, harvest that and again pull out the areas that are above average density to say, where are the spots that are most important to understand for commercial shipping or commercial traffic. Um, you notice that I've also put a sighting and performance standard next to it. Again, we'll dig into this a little bit later, but this is the specific policy that applies to that area. This is what sustains that area in the blue plan. So what that means is the policy, the blue plan, as it's read by an applicant, is that blurb right there. So if I'm an applicant, if I want to come in and put a, uh, any kind of facility in Long Island Sound, and I know I'm going to be overlapping with vessel transit areas, I have to adhere to the standard that no activity or structure I install will interfere with vessel transit or navigation, including maneuvering. And this is something that we haven't had before. You know, there's, there's never been a policy that says, you know, in Long Island Sound, maybe we don't want new development interfering with these transit routes that are very important to us economically. So this is a new thing, and it helps sustain uses that we all depend on here in Connecticut. Another SHUA we identified is uh, yacht racing areas, or sail racing areas. Um, this was really cool one to work on, because this has never been done before, to my knowledge, in the detail that we were able to execute it here. And that includes all the other marine spatial plants that are out there. Um, we were able to work very closely with some members of the Eastern Connecticut Sailing Association, in the Yacht Racing Association of Long Island Sound to, to depict these very discrete areas where yacht race, where sail racing happens, and that could be anything from, from you know, large, yacht, large boat racing offshore to much further inshore dinghy racing. Um, and again, the, the, the sighting and performance standard that an applicant proposing a project within any of these areas would need to adhere to is no fl fixed or floating structures that it interfere with race activity during the season. And during the season there is kind of an important part because we're also recognizing the, the temporal aspect of sail racing, that it's predominantly a, a spring, summer, and fall sport and not active so much in the winter. And that point becomes pretty key later on. Um, the last one of these I'm gonna show you today, and we have a bunch more. We actually show the full suite of what they are later. But the last one I'm gonna show you today is commercial fishing. Um, and I'm glad you're here. So, commercial fishing we represented a little bit differently. Um, this is a little more granular, slightly larger blocks representing the areas that are important to recreational fishing. But if you look at the data, lo and behold, recreational fishing happens throughout Long Island Sound. In some areas it's much more heavy pressure than in areas, than in others. Um, but it's there, it's throughout the Sound, so we wanted to represent it. Um, the sighting and performance standard we have for this 
is that permanent displacement of commercial fishing or related activity by any other activity or structures shall be avoided to the maximum extent practicable. And that consultation with the commercial fishing sector is required, so notification to the sector is required, commensurate with the level of intensity in any given area. Um, so we have a bunch more shuas that we'll show later. Uh, we also have all of these represented on the map viewer, which is accessible online to anyone that we'll show later. But for now, I'd like to invite Emily up to talk a little bit about the ESAs, Ecologically Significant Areas, and some of the policies of the Blue Plan in more depth. Thank you, Christian. All right, so switching gears a little bit, uh, we're going to be talking about the ESAs or the ecologically significant areas. So these are identified a little bit differently than the SHUAs. So one way in which they were identified is to look at the top quintile for most of the criteria. So basically that means the top 20% of the data for most of these data sets were determined to be the significant area. This feeds into the fact that we do consider all of Long Island Sound's ecosystem to be important. However, we needed these ESAs and these SHUAs so that we would have a better understanding of what really significant areas needed a little bit more prioritization or protection in terms of permitting decisions. And also, as Christian mentioned, the criteria definitions prevail over the maps. So the maps are static in nature. They're the best available data that we have now. Um, however, the Long Island ecosystem is going to change over time. Things are going to be different. And if there's an ecologically significant area that you see in your region that's not on the map, um, that a new project is coming into, then you could tell us, and if it fits with the definition, um, then we can identify it and put it through the proper policies of the Blue Plan. Okay, another thing to note about ecologically significant areas is a lot of these data layers were overlapped on top of one another to identify the ESA. So for instance, we, with FISH, we took four different data layers and put them together to identify this final ESA you see over there. So we looked at um, demersal species or bottom dwelling species in the spring and fall, and then also the water column species in the spring and fall um, over a set period of time. Um, one of these con contributors being from the Long Island Sound study, or Long Island Sound uh, trawl survey. So again, we collected um, a series of those data sets and then compiled them on top of one another to form the final ESA. Okay, another example would be the endangered, threatened, and species of concern layer. So this includes um, potential habitat areas for things like Atlantic sturgeon, um, for rosea tern habitats, as well as various other habitats that are identified in New York and Connecticut uh, for endangered or critical species. And you could see from this standards a little different. Um, so there's no specific standards applicable. So basically, and you'll see this in a little bit, the general ESA or SHUA policies would apply, which basically means to maintain the value and integrity of an ESA or a SHUA. However, we do add there to comply with applicable state and federal policies to avoid adverse impacts to designated species and habitats. So specifically with the endangered, threatened species concern layer, there's a lot of federal and state programs already surrounding these species um, that provide uh, really good protection. Okay, a little bit of a different type of layer is hard bottom and complex seafloor. So this is a um, really important ecological area for fish, um, as well as different species really use these complex habitats. Um, this layer is interesting and actually combines things like shipwrecks um, or terrain ruggedness indices, so just basically how much structure there is on the seafloor. Uh, you can see our siting and performance standard here is no alteration, including changes in sedimentation or turbidity that would significantly adversely impact the ecological characteristics and function of that hard bottom habitat. So we just don't want someone going in and completely ruining this uh, hard bottom habitat in a way that would be really severely detrimental to the ecological communities there. 
All right, so as you see here, this is a pretty much a whole complete list of all the diff different significant human use areas and ecologically significant areas that we've identified. Uh, we have 29 significant human use areas and then 14 ecologically significant areas. So these range in topics from recreation to marine infrastructure, marine trades, um, navigation, fishing, and then in the ecological side, we also really look at habitats and then individual species as well and where um, those individual species might be most prevalent. So we really tried to cover a range of topics um, and significant ecological and human use resources here. As Christian mentioned, um, all of these different SHUAs and ESAs are available on our Blue Plan Viewer. And we worked with a Connecticut Sea Grant in Yukon Clear to develop this, bluer, this viewer, this Blue Plan Viewer, um, so that all of these would be available um, to anyone looking to understand better in their region what are the ESAs and SHUAs present. And um, at the end of the presentation, if we have time, we could get in a little bit more to the viewer itself and how it functions and how people can use it. All right, so how do the policies really work? Um, so going back to this diagram, there's two kind of basic ways um, that we can look at how the blue plan will function in terms of the ESAs and the SHUAs. So one way is that a new use could come into the sound and it could overlap or intersect with an ESA or a significant human use area as long as it meets one of those siting and performance standards, basically doesn't do severe detriment or disturbance um, to that significant area. The other way in which is they could try to just avoid those significant areas altogether. So those are basically the two kind of main functions of how a new use can come in in terms of the significant areas. All right. Here we have our basic policy organization and process. So we have two uh, main parts to the policies, the first one being the sound-wide policies. So these are policies that apply throughout the sound and we match the three main goals with those policies. So protecting the natural resources, protecting the traditional human uses, and then also trying to avoid future conflict. The next part of that is the general ESA and SHUA policies. Again, these are general policies that just say we really want to maintain the value um, and the integrity of these significant areas. And then part 2A and part 2B really give you kind of the instructions or the guidance of how to maintain that value or integrity of the significant area. The next part of that is we would encourage an applicant or someone coming in to look at our blue plan lenses. And these are really extra tools in which to read the policies and understand the policies. They're also great ways to solve um, various problems or conflicts that might occur. So one of which is the existing laws and regulations. So there's a lot of other kind of programs that go on throughout the sound. So understanding what other um, entities you might have to look at, for instance, looking at the Endangered Species Act, if you're in one of those areas. Looking at the degree of use and or resource conflict. So not all uses or resources are gonna conflict with one another. So although you might be in an ESA or in a SHUA, your particular use might not be conflicting with that area. So you might not have to generally adhere to those policies. The reliability and specificity of data. So as I mentioned, this data is the best data that we have available right now. Um, however, there are limitations to it. Some of it might be older, or perhaps some of it might not be surveyed throughout the sound. So we just want to make sure applicants are aware that this data um, has its limitations and to just use it carefully in that sense. The duration and permanence of a resource or use. So as Christian was getting um, to with the sailing areas, there's a lot of temporal aspects of the sound. Not all uses or re uh, resources are there all the time. So just understanding seasonal changes, annual changes, um, perhaps your new use may be able to go into the sound in one season and not the other. Um, just understanding those factors may help solve a lot of the conflicts. Social community and generational equity. Um, understanding if your use is going to have a differential impact on the sound and how that might occur. Uh, Long Island Sound is a public trust uh, resource, so just kind of bringing back that point. 
And then climate change resilience and mitigation. So understanding that with climate change, over time, the sound is also going to change. So taking that into account as well. And then looking at all these processes, um, then it comes up with some potential siting options for your new use. So some really beneficial areas for yourself and also some beneficial areas that you could site a project that would avoid the most conflict. <coughs> And then as Christian was mentioning earlier, the blue plan um, actually will be uh, used in a few different other regulatory programs. So it will live in the coastal management program and it will help support the coastal management program's decision making. It will help support the coastal management program in making smarter and more compatible decisions through the maps, data, and policies. Uh, however, it will also be used in some programs um, through the Department of Agriculture, specifically aquaculture, also with the Connecticut Siting Council, and then also in some local uh, shellfish commission decisions. So there's these four entities that will be primarily using the blue plan. So not everyone is using the blue plan, only sp very specific regulatory programs, and those are listed in the blue plan. Okay, so now we'll get on to um, an example of how this works. Sure. Could you go back two slides, please? Sure. When we talk about policy organization, what is ESA and SHUA? Sure. Um, so ESA is our ecologically significant areas, and then SHUA are the significant um, human use areas. So those are the two different areas that we designate in the plan. And then over on the right, where it says potential siting option. Could you give us a couple of examples of what is being cited? Sure, so we're actually gonna get into that in a little bit, but for instance, if someone comes in with perhaps a seaweed farm, um, or a seaweed farm, or perhaps um, a big new structure in the sound, you know, there's been some talk over time of a big cross sound bridge or something, um, things like that, things that would be in the, off, uh, the um, out there waters of the sound <laughs> um, that, would need a permit through the different regulatory programs listed here. So it's not everything, you know. So for example, several years ago, there was a, uh, uh, a prospect of having a liquid natural gas transfer station. Yes. Just over the border in New York. Yes. With this plan, would that anything to do with that? It would. It would actually, because I believe that was a federal project, right? Federally regulated. Federally regulated project. So the blue plan since. Was it a private company, not a federal company? A private company was federally regulated. Say again? It was federally regulated, but it was a private company. Yeah. So since it was a private company, however, there was federal action behind it, so federal regulation behind it, meaning that even if it is in New York waters, if there is certain federal actions that take place in New York waters, if the blue plan is living in our coastal management program, that means that we can have some influence on certain federal actions in New York waters. So there's another kind of arm to this as well in that sense. Thank you. Sure. So now we'll get to some more examples on how this will function. Thanks, Emily. And Frank, I think we're going to get into your question a little bit more over the next couple of slides. So hopefully this will become a little bit clearer. Um, so one of the main benefits the Blue Plan provides is just a knowledge base for what's out there, for, for who your neighbors are in Long Island Sound. And particularly to the question, if, if I'm proposing a project, you know, whether it's something small, like a, maybe a, a one acre seaweed farm, or something large, like a liquid natural gas platform, I should know who's out there and who I'm gonna be interacting with. Um, the information, if I go to do that right now today, if I'm, a, if I'm a seaweed farmer and I wanna think about putting in a farm, the information available to me, to me today is basically what's on the, uh, what you see on the left hand side of the screen there the nautical chart without a lot of other information on it other than the depths and the buoys and the lights and the marks. Um, if I'm clever, I can go in, do a little bit more digging, find out where the aquaculture lease beds are. You've got a bit of them down here. Um, and if I'm really clever, I can go in and see also 
where the, the U.S. ace, the Army Corps, uh, federally maintained areas are. But other than that, I really don't know where the fishing's happening. I don't know where the sailing's happening. I don't know where the shipping is going through. Um, with the blue plan, I would. With the blue plan, you can go into the viewer and see each of those areas and know what's out there, know who your neighbors are. Um, now again, if I'm, a, if I'm a small entrepreneur, I might look at that and think, oh my god, there's no, there's no room at all for anything in Long Island Sound. But that's not true, because if you read the site and the performance standards and you understand how all these things happen, there's actually a lot of potential for collaboration out there with the other folks that use the sound. And a lot of it's common sense stuff. So if I want to put it in a, a seaweed farm, I might look at that and say, oh, well, those, those pink areas are sail racing areas. And seaweed farming is predominantly a winter activity with, a, with an early spring harvest. And so it's out right around this time of the year. They can have the gear out of the water. Funny, because right at about that time, maybe a little bit later, is when the sailboats are going in and you're starting up the races. Um, so if I'm proposing that and I now have the information of the blue plan, I can go and I can talk to the, the yacht club that's operational there, has a, has a race in that area, and say, hey, listen, guys, I understand you're going to be there. I'm, I'm proposing this project. Um, just wanted you to know that my, what, you know, what, when are you guys going to have your boats in the water? When's your, your first race? So that I can have my gear out of the water and we're not going to be impeding each other at all. Um, this stands very different from the process that we have now where someone applying for a seaweed farm might not know what was out there, might you know, get pretty far into the permit application process, might spend a lot of their time, might spend a lot of their money, might already have purchased supplies, um, only to have the, the project go out on public notice and incur lots of resistance from a community who thinks it's going to restrict their access to any given area. This really helps circumvent a lot of that conflict. Um, so looking at another example, also using seaweed farms, um, but this time not, not in neck of the woods down here, more in the Stony Creek area. Um, these are the ESAs, and in particular, these are some of the, the bottom relevant ecologically significant areas. So you see demersal fish here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. No, but okay, these dark red areas are demersal fish. Um, you can also see that, that black policy line closer into the coast. Um, those blue blocky areas are shellfish management areas, so leased shellfish beds. Um, those dark purple areas are areas of hard bottom. We saw the, the slide for that ESA. Um, and those green areas, much, in, much closer into shore, are Connecticut natural diversity database information. Basically, where, the, where we know there are rare, unique, endangered species. Um, building on that, and you can do this in the Blue Plan Viewer right online right now, building on that, you can add some human use areas. So those large pink blobs are sail areas, those chunky green lines are important shipping areas, important navigation areas. Um, and those dark blue areas that appeared are important recreational fishing areas. So now if me as the applicant come in and think, you know, all right, well, where can I, where can I site a seaweed farm? I might be thinking originally about putting a, a large seaweed farm over on the right side of the screen. Um, but if I look at that, that might be overlapping with, with demersal fish zones. And depending on what type of gear I'm using, I might think, you know, maybe I really don't want to do that because that's going to have a negative impact on the fish in that area, and I'm much less likely to get a permit. I'm much more likely to cause environmental conflict and to, to receive pushback from the community. Um, similarly, if I look over on, the, on that blue circle, kind of on the, the right side of the screen, maybe in dead center of the screen, that's on, on top of a, an important recreational fishing area, which you can see is also there because of the hard bottom, because there's a lot of fish there, because it's good habitat for them probably also not the best place to be sighting a seaweed farm because you're going to be interrupting people's public access to that area where they, they like to go fishing and you're also going to be damaging a habitat that in that area is somewhat unique. Um, so using the information available in the blue plan, I might think that that third dot kind of in the middle of the other two is a much better place for me to cite this where I'm not causing environmental degradation, where I'm not restricting people's access to something they like doing and where I'm likely more, more likely to receive a permit from the responsible agencies because they know that I am not impeding anyone or damaging anything. Um, and so again, the point I should make with all this is none of, none of these areas 
are restrictive. None of these areas, ecological or significant human use, are no-go zones. There's always, you know, if a, if a use is compatible with them, of course it makes sense that you can be compatible and you can share that space. That's logical. That's fine. Um, the flip side of that is, you know, none of these areas tell people like, oh, you know, you used to be able to, to fish everywhere, now you can only fish here. No. That's just a, an understanding of where the areas most important to recreational fishing are so we can better protect them and better represent them in the planning process. So the take-home points from tonight, the blue plan identifies and protects the special areas in Long Island Sound in very many cases for the first time. This information never existed before. We never had publicly available or at least easily accessible where important fishing areas are, where important sailing areas are, where important shellfish areas are, important commercial fishing. Um, we just didn't know. And the regulatory committee that's supposed to be approving projects also didn't know. So they didn't know if they were going to be approving something that could potentially cause conflict. They didn't know if they were being too conservative in issuing a permit for fear of causing that conflict. Um, which I guess is the second take home point for tonight, that this provides a lot more information and guidance through, the, through the, the specific associated policies to the regulatory process to really help our buddies out at the state when they're making these decisions um, and to help us as citizens who use and care about Long Island Sound to better understand the, the waters and resources we have accessible to us now. And the last point is a really, really crucial one. The blue plan is draft, and the blue plan is supposed to represent you and everything you care about in Long Island Sound. This is your plan for how you want to see Long Island Sound used now and in the future. Um, the only way we can do our job of better representing you in the plan in this process is if we hear from you. So that's one of the, one of the main points of tonight is to really connect you guys with this, to help everyone here better understand the planning process the potential outcomes, and hear what you have to say, what you can, what we should know to make this better. Um, that's why we've got the, these comment sheets here, so again, if you want to fill one of those out, please feel free. Um, this comment period is open until June 21st, so you've got a little while longer to, to go online, fill out comment sheets there, or just email us, or call us. Um, I'm sure my phone number is out there drifting around. It's on a lot of the, uh, the advertisements for, for the event tonight and the other regional events we're hosting around the state. Um, so please feel free to give, give us a buzz, shoot us an email, contact us however you like. We would really like to hear from you. Um, so with that, I guess I'm just going to put up the contact information for DEEP and say thank you very much, everyone, for being here tonight, for listening, and how can we help answer your questions? Yeah, you ma'am. Yeah. Um, some of us here in the room have been battling the state and the deep for the past 10 years because uh, a 14 acre boat yard was illegally destroyed in Stanford and that has crushed recreational boating. So, and that was at the hands of a private developer and the former governor. So, what's to say that Ned Lamont or any other official and a greedy developer wants to come in and put wind turbines in the middle of Long Island Sound? So there's two answers to that. First of all, um, Long Island Sound is not a good place for wind turbines. There's the, the wind energy here is, and for everyone else, the, the question is, what's to stop a developer from just coming in and installing wind turbines or any other kind of development anyway? Um, for one, Long Island Sound isn't really good for wind development to that specific concern. Um, our wind energy is way too low. It doesn't make a lot of sense to put those here. Two, the sound-wide policies in the blue plan point to not wanting the negative impacts that large offshore, offshore industry like that would bring to Long Island Sound, um, not wanting the, the negative visual impacts and the negative, act, you know, the restricted access that that would have offshore. Um, thirdly, if anyone ever thinks that the, blue, that the blue plan policies are not being followed, that poor planning is happening, that's your right as a citizen to take that back to deep and say, hey, we don't think you're adhering to the blue plan. We don't think you're doing a good job of sticking to this plan that you've laid forth, which is supposed to represent all of us. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, I, I think I want to follow up on that. In your, in your just prior slide, what 
what either what legislative component, what what mandates that the blue plan would become a policy document that these agencies need to follow? Yeah, that's the the legislative mandate that created it, and so this was created in 2015 by the legislature, handed down to Deep and said, create this, create a spatial plan for the sound. Um, after we have finished going through this process, it goes back to the legislature and they vote on it and say whether or not we want, this is the spatial plan that they want to have, that it's complete and good and meets all the guidelines that they set out. That still means that it's a plan, but I'm, I'm still not sure where the teeth come that the agencies must then rely on it. That, that's part of the legislation that created it, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it's Public Act 1566 Thank 2015. You. This is yeah, it's, uh, the statutory citation is 25157T if you want to look it up. <laughs> but but it, it still exists, it seems, as an overlay on other regulations that are in place today. So is it a sort of more generalized overlay? Does, its, does the teeth of its policies cut less sharply but more provide gentle guidance? Yes, it's supposed to be supportive of the existing Coastal Management Act. So the Coastal Management Act policies will still exist, they exist throughout the Sound, but it's meant to be supportive of those policies and also provide more guidance in terms of there's more maps, more data, more clear decision making. And in that sense, I would say it's more specific rather than more general. It adds a lot more specificity to the existing regulatory programs. Is that in the sense of integrating the ESAs and the SHUAs, whereas other things were not that more compartmentalized? They were more compartmentalized, and the policies in the Coastal Management Act and the other statutes are a lot broader. Here it's pretty specific. We know these are the areas where these resources and uses are. We have policies for each of those, and these are what you need to take into account. So I would just add to that. So in my own interpretation, uh, it's this interesting balance in the sense that it's not a new regulatory permit. It's an existing permit that you would have to get to today. But there's teeth in this in the sense that if adopted by the legislature, these policies would provide direction in how the agencies are issuing the same permits that are issued today, the kind of facts they have to take into account and policies they need to adhere to. So those performance standards that were up on those slides are not just general ideas, see how you feel about it, it's actually direction to the agencies that have to issue that permit. So it's a balancing act in the sense it's not a new regulatory permit, but there's greater clarity, greater specificity as to how that existing permit is going to be granted. And so that's why I would say, Jennifer, I think you're asking about the, some of the uh, governors pointing something down in the sound. This provides a whole lot more consistency and authority that says, no, these collectively uh, represent what we, the citizens, want from our own sound. And of course, the legislature uh, will make that sort of collective public decision right here as to whether this plan, as it's been drafted, does it have a Yeah. I sort of feel like I'm in the white road here. <laughs> um, I'm a little worried that th this plan sort of starts at the 10-foot level, you would say. Uh, Coastal Management Act is above that, really. And um, we've seen instances where the Coastal Management Act isn't adhered to and they violate their own, their own policies. And I'm thinking specifically of Stanford. Mm -hmm. Uh, where they they have gotten rid of things that they should should that the coastal management act said should have remained. So how is this going to put teeth back into that? By having the the specific siting and performance standards. The question is how is this going to put teeth to back into the coastal management act? When when they have violated their own policies. So I can't speak to any of those particular concerns. I might hand it off to the folks at DEEP who have more experience than me in that. Well, if you're going to, uh, uh, well, first of all, the blue plan wouldn't apply to that particular site. But are, are, are you saying that be, because it's below the 10-foot line, or are you saying it because the blue plan is coming into effect after that sort both, of place? Both. Uh, it won't be in effect until the legislature approves it. 
and it was the legislature chose the 10 foot line so it wouldn't duplicate or uh, complicate the existing programs that deal with the more coastal areas. But if you're going to assume that your government officials are corrupt and bent on disregarding their the, the laws and policies that they're supposed to follow, uh, no law or policy can prevent that. But the blue plan will make it more difficult because it provides a lot more information and a lot more specific standards, performance standards and goals and policies that have to be taken into account in that area. It makes it... And those, those goals and policies and standards are designed to protect water-dependent activities and uses and public access. Okay, now I didn't use the word corrupt, but there, there certainly was a case where the government officials did not follow their own rules. But uh, what, what I'm concerned about is that if something upland will have a detrimental effect on the coastal areas below the 10 foot line, yet the two don't talk, talk, talk to one another because they're in different segments. One's the Coastal Management Act, the other one's the Blue Plan. I mean, what, what benefit are we getting? They do talk to each other. The statute says that the Coastal Management Act policies are cons to be consistent with the Blue Plan policies. And the same, uh, the same agency is implementing both. The same permit process implements both. So it's not that uh, they're in separate silos. Yeah. Uh, interesting article last summer in the Times about the dismantling of the old Tavazee Bridge and they were going to haul that debris and make four or five new fish habitats on the north and south side of Long Island. Now, is that something they talked to you about or is that just a New York Waters thing? So that's something that was going on while we were doing the inventory of the sound. So we recognized that they were, that those reefs were created. Um, they were actually nourishing existing artificial reefs, so they, they had the fish havens, as they called them, out there already, and they were adding new materials to them. New York has a process for evaluating and improving those that Connecticut does not. So New York accepts artificial reefs in their waters. Currently, Connecticut does not accept artificial reefs created in our waters. And I don't know if you guys want to add anything about that. Well, it, it's not that, that artificial reefs are prohibited. They just, uh, our fisheries folks don't like to displace existing habitat with artificial habitat. But the Blue Plan does allow some policies for creating and restoring uh, certain types of habitat. So it gives some guidance on that. But it I guess doesn't my, say. Yeah, I guess plan. I should have rephrased the question. Since you said it, you interact with the New York waters, if they do something in New York waters, do they? tell you what they're going to do because it could affect the local ecology of both states. Right. So I'll just say, if, if it's a state action on the New York side, then Connecticut, the blue plan, since it primarily applies in state waters, would have influence in that sense only if it's a federal action. So I'll just make that kind of one. Yeah, le yes, legally that's true, but we would expect that our friends in New York, now that they have this great source of information, that they would use it. <laughs> They're not, we can't make <coughs> them use it, but uh, what, if we assume that they will, why wouldn't they? Never assume anything. <laughs> well, just as the article said, the artificial reefs that where they've been installed before were very, very productive, very helpful for fish habitat. Yeah or just wildlife in general. I guess I would just add also about this federal thing, federal action we keep talking about. Many projects require a federal permit, an Army Corps of Engineers permit or what have you. That then comes under what we're talking about in terms of federal action. So if, a, if an artificial reef or a fish haven project needs a federal permit, the blue plan through the coastal consistency would have a say in what happens with that federal decision. So if we didn't like the way they were doing it, 
uh, we would have some influence with that, let's say, Corps of Engineers or other permanent purpose of aviation. And we don't have that. We don't have that authority now. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, I worked with your Department of Agriculture, um, and uh, uh, I can say that well, we did pay some attention to what Connecticut's <laughs> doing, so um, there's lots of ways to, um, to interact. But the questions I have actually are around, because one place we were really looking at, I moved over the border, so I'm here, I'm excited to be at this meeting. Um, the, the things that we were looking at, uh, we we're really looking at Connecticut for your leadership around permitting in um, seed farms. Hmm. And so I'm curious, just, it's been like a year or so that I, since I've checked in on this, um, you're really talking about seaweed farms here. Are you talking about the ocean column seaweed farms? Do you have specific, or are you looking at like the widespread sort of um, different kind of like, I think it's Gracilaria or something, you know, like that flat, flat yeah. farming? What do you, what is, when you talk about seaweed, and I often have sale here, what are you talking about with these seaweed farms? So the, the blue plate, the question is which, you know, specific gear types and installation types are we looking at when we think about any type of New, new proposed use in Long Island Sound? And the answer is that the blue plan doesn't look at one use versus another, doesn't look at this gear type versus that gear type. It looks at impacts. What are they going to be the impacts of that use on any given area? Um, and so permits are evaluated based on that. So certain gears may have a lower impact than other gears. Um, speaking of seaweed farms, for instance, there are many different anchor types out there. Some of them are a lot lower impact than others. Um, so that's something that the, the regulating agencies granting the permit would take into account now, but also with a blue plan in place to give them a lot more information and guidance about those areas where that gear will be installed. Yeah? Do you have a uh, state of Connecticut cost to develop this project, including the impact? Yeah. Um, <laughs> all being done within existing resources. Um, Emily's time, a lot of it comes from NOAA. She's a coastal management fellow. And my time comes from grants from the Long Island Sound Study and a couple other funders. So other than that, the state is had no additional resources contributed to it to do this plan. And so all of our, all of our friends up in Hartford are doing this within existing resources on their, in their regular time. That's amazing. Yeah, Frank. Other than, other than meetings like this, what plans do you have for peer review or quality control of the data that has been accumulated? And I'll give an example. In a quick flashby, it looked like there was no sailboat racing off at the Roten Point. <laughs> so I could pick that up. But if I could pick that up, there's so much other stuff that could, that well, errors could creep in inadvertently. How do you how are you doing a peer review for other quality control uh, uh, techniques? That's a great question, and the question is, how are we doing a peer review? Um, do, you want to, do you want me to take a stab at it first, or do you want to just jump right in? So I was going to say that we, um, the data collection and review process was actually a, a pretty lengthy chunk of time that we went through in 2018. Um, we first held a series of webinars where we advertised, connected to the public. You know, this is, again, looking at something as specific as seal racing that is much more known publicly than known in published journals. Um, we first, you know, talk, held, had held some webinars that said, this is the existing published data that exists. Do you think this is sufficient to represent what you know about seal racing? Um, and in the case of seal racing, that's a good one, you brought that up, we actually got a formal comment at one of our public hearings not public meeting, but public hearing, that said, no, you guys do not have nearly enough data to represent sail racing. This is completely insufficient. So that's when we went back, worked with the leaders of the Eastern Connecticut Sailing Association and the Yacht Racing Association, um, brought them together, did a participatory mapping workshop and where we went across the entire state, you know, very zoomed in on the charts, and had folks map where they know racing happens. Now, I think you're right. I think we probably did miss some areas in that. Um, I, I may have missed it. You know, I may have read it wrong. Yeah. It, and it's, it's a simple error. But I'm using that as an example for some other simple errors in the 50 layers deep that you're working with. What sort of quality control system do you have set up? I think Sylvain wants to take that. <laughs> I'd like to respond to that. I, 
I, I was the chair of the, of the group that put together the inventory, so seeking information from as many sources as we could. We spent about two years gathering information from wherever we could, whatever existed, whatever we knew existed, whatever we heard might exist, get our hands on it. And then we had two rounds. We had a, a, a technical review round. Does that stand up to modern criteria? Is it a map? Is it electronic? Is it available? And then the, 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 the second tier was putting it back in front of people. You're a sailor. Here's what we found. Does that make sense to you? And if the answer was yes, then we're good. If the answer was no, we went back to the drawing board and, and gathered more information. At times, information was not available, but we reached out to people to generate, to put as much information as we could on a map. For, for some other things, we, we found no information on commercial fishing, for example. We put that in front of commercial fishermen, they were laughing. They said, <laughs> they said when the maps say that, that those pingers say that we're, we're going less than five knots, we're fishing, that's not true. That's when we, we, we hit some, some, some seas, when we're on our way out to go fish somewhere else. Mm -hmm. so, so we put it back in front of people and asked, does that look like what you know of Long Island Sound? And, and, and we spent two years doing that. It's not perfect, it's not gonna be perfect, but it's as good as we can get it in about two years. And we intend to continue to put it back in front of people. And if you have comments, if you take a card, or if you, if you write an email, we will take into account every piece of information we can get because that's important. You are the peer reviews and you are the quality <coughs> control. And, and for the two years of the inventory, we could document about six or 700 people. We put the information back in front of, we went to the different sectors, we went to different geography, and, and, and we said, does that look like what you know? And if the answer is no, we still have work to do. Is that, does, does that make sense? Yes. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll follow up on that. Well, you too. described how you got here, and, and it, the thrust of my question yeah. is other than public hearings like this, how are you open to collecting new information? For example, yes, there's a sailboat recently out of the broken point. I'd hate to flog that, but you're in a group of sailors here. And I think we missed it. But using that as an example of shell fishing or water temperature or what, 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 what's the go forward plan? So to, to follow up on that particular question, the statutory language requires that the blue plan at a minimum be revisited and revised every five years. So at a minimum, there will be other iterations of this. And in that time, we'll be looking to accumulate more information. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we would have to wait five years to include new information. As that came through, if it was identified, if it was vetted and verified, we could go ahead and include that. And between those five years, the advisory committee that guides this process is required to hold at least one public hearing each year to sort of provide a forum and a voice for comments that come in. So structurally in the big picture, that's what we're going with. There are obviously a lot of details to refine there that we'll have to put together as we go forward, but that's the big vision. And if I can just uh, add on to that. The Christian, I think, said in the, the presentation that the maps are sort of a guidance, but it's really the description of the of the human use that kind of drives whether or not the policies apply. So we understand that we've missed, you know, we probably missed some things with regard to being able to map absolutely everything because we don't know everything yet. But we know what the descriptions are of those activities. And so if that activity meets the description, and you can provide that information to us through that regulatory process, then we can include that as uh, a consideration of what we do policies. Because it's not the maps that drive it, it's the description of the activity. That drives the map. That, that drives whether the policy applies. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you described this tonight as not a regulatory document, but one for, it's a plan and it's for guidance. But would there be adverse implications uh, to a group if the use of their, their, their intended use was inconsistent with what your conclusions are, how portions of Long Island Sound are to be used? Hypothetical to them. One is, what if the yacht has been sailing in a certain spot for three quarters of a century and it happens to be inconsistent with the plan that you described with your color coded maps of the Long Island Sound? 
Or another one would be, what if there's a well-meaning nonprofit that wants to put a kelp farm and it's not in an area that you've identified as suitable for kelp farming? Are there adverse implications possible for those two hypotheticals? So there, the question is, I'm going to try to get this right because there are a couple parts to it. Um, what if, a, what if a yacht club's been sailing in an area that isn't identified as a yacht sailing area? Um, and the second half of that question is, what if there's an application for a kelp farm in an area that doesn't appear to be conducive to having a kelp farm there? Um, to answer the first one, that's very simple. No, what I was trying to say before, and I think I only briefly touched on it, so I'm glad you followed up with the question. Um, these don't designate areas where things can be done. These don't zone places for things like yacht racing. Um, like this, the question before yours, if, if there's a yacht race that's happening out there or a sail race or anything that's been happening out there that we simply missed picking up in the mapping process, we, we would rather know about that and represent it. But nothing in this is ever going to say, don't sail here anymore. Don't do this. That's your activity and your, your of course, you know, allowed and encouraged to, to continue doing that there. This doesn't do anything like zoning, like saying this can only happen over here or this can only happen over here. Anything that's, a, that's an unregulated activity, sailing, can happen anywhere where it always has happened and always will happen. Um, to your point about the seaweed farm, this gives regulators that, that sign off on those permits a lot better guidance. So in the same way that it doesn't zone for for seaweed farming or aquaculture or anything like that. It doesn't set areas specifically for those. Um, it gives guidance for how to approve places that might make sense for that to happen if an application comes into it. So what you might be thinking of is something like the Rhode Island plan, where they designated an area for, for alternative wind, for renewable wind or renewable energy specifically activities. Um, this doesn't do anything like that. This says only for regulated activities and new regulated activities at that do you now have more guidance for where those may be compatible and where those may be incompatible um, and I think I saw a couple hands go up over here of people that wanted to address that a little further I just wanted to really emphasize that point um, again the whole purpose of this plan is to protect um, protect those existing uses all those things that we've mentioned like sailing particularly there's never been an opportunity before to actually identify and, and shout out for sailing and racing in the regulatory system. Uh, you would have to show up at a hearing and say, hey, you might be interfering with where we sail in the current system as it is today. Now you actually have a use that's being recognized. Uh, this, again, protects the existing uses. The whole point is to protect what we're already doing out there. And so there's not only nothing you need to do to keep doing what you're doing, but we're trying to save what you're doing so you can keep doing it. The second thing is that, again, it's not a yes or no, if you, you, know, if you want to do a seaweed farm, you already have to get a permit today, but now that permit is going to be much better informed. We've, we've seen situations where uh, permits have been granted that actually caused direct conflicts because the people at the Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Aquaculture, didn't know all the information. They weren't trying to be mean, they just didn't know all of the uses that were going on in a certain area. Now it's going to be harder for that permit permitter to say, sure, you can do a seaweed farm in a place that's really got a lot of conflicts. But that doesn't mean that you can't try to go in that area or try to find a better area. Uh, seaweed farming is something that generally is probably a, a good thing and no one's trying to stop it. So it's how do we help it happen better. So hopefully that helps. Where's the regular completion for that example take place? Is that a, at the state level? So just you the, the example of the seaweed. Yeah, so I'm, there may be others who better explain. So, so if someone who wants to do a seaweed farm has to get a permit from the, from the Bureau of Aquaculture today. Same thing happens after the blueprint. They need to get a permit from the Bureau of Aquaculture. But the Bureau of Aquaculture would have to follow the blueprint policies. They have to follow the blueprint information. Not only is that not available to them today, but they don't have to do that today. If the blueprint passes, they, would have, they have to incorporate that intelligence into the decision. And I, I think it might be good to just emphasize the one point Christian made. Um, it kind of gets at your one point in the question. Um, the blue plan doesn't look backwards on activities that are already have permits. So it only will be applied to new applications and new permits. So if something is permitted and perhaps it wasn't in the most ideal area for various reasons, they didn't have all the information, the blue plan doesn't then say this is unpermittable, you have to take it out. It doesn't. 
work that way. It's only for new um, permits once it is approved. I'd like to add one more other thing to that, to that comment. Yeah. Um, there was a proposed kelp farm uh, being put in, in Greenwich, and I believe I saw the notice uh, in the local notice to Mariners, and uh, where it was cited, it would have actually conflicted with what I call a secret passage. It's a little cut in, in between great captains and little captains that only idiots like me get through. Um, yeah. And I had commented on it, and I asked them to move it like 100 yards to the east, which they did. Yeah. But, but that came through so, the North America. So that's actually a funny story. I know that uh, that particular aquaculturalist, and she was trying to figure out, where are all these instructions coming from to keep moving my farm? So with a blue plan in place, she would have a better idea of where to apply in the first place to not have to keep shuffling her farm around um, after she's already gone through a significant amount of the permitting process. So thank you for saying that, because that's the, like, a perfect example of why we need a blue plan in place. Uh, yeah, I saw your hand first. Um, I was really pleased to hear that you've got coordination to some extent with New York because there's lots of things that we have to coordinate with New York. Does the blue plan address dredge disposal? Because I know that we're at odds with New York on dredge disposal. Can yeah. Does the blue plan include that? So the blue plan says two things about dredge disposal. One, that Connecticut needs to maintain our harbors and channels by dredging them because they silt up and two that existing designated spoil disposal areas are recognized as significant human use areas for a couple of reasons one because you need to dispose to spoils there but also because you probably don't want to go around mucking up and disturbing them with any other sort of project okay, um, and i don't know if the guys from deep want to add anything to that <clears throat> that's basically it cool um yeah, I hear you. To what extent is sustainability being built into the into the plan? The idea that, that um, uh, how how um, different activities are going to allow the environment to, to uh, continue to exist and thrive. Um, I, I know there was a project for, for mapping the entire um, um, sea floor on the side. I don't know how far that got. I presume it provides a, a good idea of, of what what grows where or what lives where and, and to the extent that we might, might be able to measure the sustainability. But uh, has that been taken into account? So some of that data is included in the blue plan. It's only been it's only taken place in two portions of the sound so far, both pretty pretty small areas. But that data has been included. Um, in terms of sustainability, not so much in terms of sustainability, but in terms of climate change and climate change resiliency has been accounted for as one of the lenses that will be that Emily spoke about that will be used when reviewing a project. Um, I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that. Well, I can just sort of follow up a little bit on the C4 mapping piece. Uh, so right now, the, the part that's been completed and done in total is a section from uh, Bridgeport to roughly Port Jefferson area. And all that information, the final information that's been delivered out of that has been included in the plan. The second phase of that project, which is going on from roughly the Connecticut River to points east, is still in the process of being finalized. So we're actually able to get some of the researchers to deliver some of their products ahead of time that we're able to use. But the sum total of all the information is still in draft format. Thank you. And in terms of sustainability, the underlying, one of the underlying goals of the plan is to maintain and preserve those things that we care about in Long Island Sound. So uh, all the policies are geared in, in maintaining and preserving and avoiding adverse impacts to the functions and values that, that exist now. I just wanted to point out that under our logo, the Brooklyn logo, it says sustainable ecosystems, compatible uses. So four words in it, it says everything. We're trying to sustain the ecosystems of the sound and, and provide for compatible uses between uses and between uses and between ecosystems. Right now, what you're most of you talking about is people, uh, uh, you know, people are quite right concerned about whether they will use the long island sound. I just feel that you're quite right to pick these the what's already existing there, living there, and you can advocate. Thank you. Yeah.
David, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, a question and comment. First of all, um, I'd like to commend you and the agencies involved in putting together this plan. It's not all the time the state agencies actually cooperate um, as much as you may think that they do. Um, and I also want to make a comment on the use of the word, words and the phrase public trust. Um, I'm the local health director here in Darien, and I served recently on the state development of the state water plan, which was the entire water resources inland that had to do with allocation of stream flow and drinking water and 600 and some odd page document that got hung up because of the word public trust, that water is a public trust. And so I caution, I don't know where it sits, that phrase sits in this plan. But I know it got the state water plan, which is very big and very important to the state of Connecticut, caught up because of that phrase. All the competing interests got really invested in that phrase. That was that was like it was a stumbling block in getting because that was a legislative directed study and plan that was that was done, completed the last legislative session. And it didn't get through legislation because that phrase, and the governor signed it into law, but it's back in the legislature now. We, we learned about that this year. Mm -hmm. It was Representative Breska who warned us about that. Um, and uh, so yes, and we probably have used the term more widely in the past than we are currently using it. Um, Long Island Sound is owned by the people. Uh, that's an important factor, but we, we want to be careful that we don't provoke anyone to misinterpret all it, it was say. a surprise to the people who worked so hard on that plan that, that it ran into so much trouble. What yeah. is the offense of that language, public trust? I, um, I had it explained to me, and I'm not quite sure that I really quite understood it, but I think it had to do with, um, it was primarily raised by the water companies. Uh, who felt that um, they may end up in times of, and I think it stems from issues in California, where the competing interests in California led to water being used for one thing rather than something else, and by certain larger communities or water users than others. So it, it has to do with complete competition for the resource. As opposed to public trust. Uh, you know, to me, water is public. I mean, there's no question about it. It's very cheap with that. Yeah. Um, we're going to go with your question, because I know your hand's been up a while. Um, first of all, Thanks, I, David. I think it's terrific. Uh, an informed vote or informed decision making is so important in our democracy, and it's making us worry about what we read out of Washington. So I thank everyone here for the very articulately going through what the this plan is. Um, I know that I, I live in Norwalk. I'm on the Harbor Management Commission's subcommittee called the Water Quality Committee. And I was on the original uh, Harbor Management Commission many years ago when I was much younger. And uh, so the thing is, I'm so happy that this is coming about given what had happened with different utilities uh, trying to put, and we on occasion have problems with um, liquid filled. Uh, utility wires going under the sound to Port Jeff, et cetera, um, and we, we plan, we know that there have been upgrades. The main thing I wanted to know is, um, uh, I had heard some scuttlebutt from the Shellfish Commission and our Harbor Management Commission. They were wondering why this was necessary. Is it going to compete with them? Is it going to help them? And I assured them that this seemed like it was going to assist them in backing up some of their concerns with data, especially a lot of the high-tech equipment. You've been spending very much time. But I wanted to make sure that, and what are the plans for the public education of public officials, uh, coastal um, land use officials, and state officials? Because thing, people change, they retire. And I love the fact that this will be kind of institutionalizing some of the geology, the, uh, the, the fish, the species. It'll help with that. But what are the plans, uh, I don't know if you have any money, and if you need it, we'll help you get it. Um, money for education of coastal users, businesses, and uh, legislators, and um, decision makers. All right, so great question, two parts. First is, 
is the, in, is the intent and how will this data be helpful to local planning initiatives? And two, what's the, what's the plan for, for helping educate those folks to better use it? Um, so the first one, as Emily's slide showed that a lot of the state, a lot of the blue plan is legislatively mandated to be used by local shellfish commissions in their decision making capacity. Um, we're also hoping and we're working with a couple, we have two municipal planners on our advisory committee right now. Um, but we, we encourage all planners to use the information and the guidance in the, in the blue plan and the inventory when making decisions. Um, to your second point about outreach and education, um, so I'm the outreach coordinator for this process. So right now all of our, all of our energy is focused on going through the public process, hearing comment, collecting the input that we've heard tonight to make a better plan. After we have revised that and it's going to the legislature, my role will be you know, reaching out to groups just like that and working with them so that they better understand the blue plan as it exists and how they can best apply it and how it can help them in their jobs. So we have plans for it. It's not ready yet. <laughs> she was talking to me first, Sylvain. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. I took you to say that thus far you hadn't spent any significant amount of money. So, I don't handle the budget. Um, money allocated to the blue plan process is paid for my time. Um, it's paid for the map viewer which is online, it's paid for the, the staff time to do that, um, the infrastructure to host that, it's paid for a consultant who has worked through the ecological characterization process to help convene the scientific community you know, and figure out what those areas are. But, you know what you've spent so far. Um, I think one of these guys over here might have a rougher idea than I will, what or a better idea. What I would say is that the legislation was passed, set, you know, it was basically on the basis that there would be no fiscal note, that would not incur expenses, new expenses to the state. So within that, there's been a lot of effort to get grants, and and volunteers such as ourselves have spent our, our regular staff time devoted to this. <coughs> the total, to answer your question directly, if you put all the grants together, I think it's about four to five hundred thousand dollars in total. Four to five hundred. Four to five. Four to five hundred thousand. I don't remember if it's like four hundred and twenty or. You know. And just as a clarification, I, I my job is that. As a professor at the University of Connecticut, I lead a center. In that capacity, I could write grants. Nathan, as part of a, a, a nonprofit organization, could raise money. Our, our, our friends at the state were not in a position to write grants and raise money. We contributed time and effort to raise funds to, for example, pay for Christian time. I'm just assuming that if the legislature passes and approves it, that they'll allocate some. That's that's out of our hands. But, but know, we, the, uh, we contributed to, to our, our our task was to contribute to the development of a plan that was going to be at no cost to the state. Most I don't know about your world, but in my world, most time and effort costs <coughs> some money, right? So 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 we look to the outside to to generate a little bit of funding to support some basic activities and to lead us to to the development of a plan that hopefully will be uh, adopted by, by the legislature. The rest is out of our hands. The other thing I can just add real quickly, that I would give credit to the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection in that internally they made a decision to pull staff together and we've had a great working relationship with the, these folks who made the time. I don't know what else is not getting done, but they made the time to make this happen. They contribute a tremendous amount. And uh, Kevin, for example, he does a lot of the GIS, all these maps that you see. He's doing that with his regular staff time. So the grants have been really helpful, but it's also that he's put a lot in this as well. And other, probably other agencies too. Well, thank you. And I just want to add too that the video series that was produced, uh, we used um, $60,000 from the Long Island San License Plate Fund. From the what? The License Plate Fund. Oh, yeah. The part so, was it already taken by the legislature. Correct. For other purposes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quiet, so they don't know it's there. Yeah. But um, yeah, we were able to use this, this, that, that, that you know, contributions to that fund have uh, fallen off 
you know, pretty precipitously. So we don't have a lot of money to use for things, but the education and outreach is one of the, the four um, main components of using those license plate funds. And so we were able to, to do that, and um, that's how we got that video series produced. Great. Thanks. All right. I've seen your hand up for a while. Um, you just answered one of my questions. Where, is, where, where did it come from? Who was driving the need for it? And now I can see it was part of deep, et cetera, et cetera, it needed this information. So that was, you just answered it. And the other is just a request. Would it be possible to back up on the slides? One of the first ones that had your mission statement, you know, guidelines. Sure. So you're thinking of the goals, which. The goal. Are here. I want to take a picture for my, uh, for my committees. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I saw a hand up over here. Yeah, thank you, Rose. Just one. Um, this is a great plan, and I, I, I've really been very impressed with it. But, but it's got to go before the state legislature. Correct. So do you have a sense for, how, will they be favorably disposed towards this, or is it something you're going to have to sell to them? So when it was... When Public Act 1556 came through and was the mandate to create this, yeah. that was unanimously approved. That came unanimously from the legislature. That being said, certainly wouldn't be opposed to everyone writing to their to their senator representative and saying, hey, go ahead and give a vote for the blue plan, if you please. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I would just add that I think, I honestly believe this, um, if people really understand what this is and how it's designed and what its intent is, I think it'll pass unanimously. Uh, it's really about making winners and winners. It's not one of these things about picking environmentalists or your users and all of that. And it doesn't tell new users to go away either. It doesn't say you can't come here. It says if you're going to come here, we're helping you to understand much better what you actually have to deal with. That you are going to have to do it now, but you're going to, but it's going to be much cloudier, and it might be much harder for you. So it's not really a lose lose for anyone. The biggest danger that we have is that people will project their fears into this. It is new, and it's as as I think you said earlier, um, it's a very busy place with people have a lot of interest. So there's a lot of concern. What are you doing that's going to change things? And so our biggest challenge is to make sure that we educate people as to what this actually is. So it's, we really appreciate when folks can come out and actually take the time to learn. And that's, that's why we're here tonight. That's why we're meeting down. We, we, we've held meetings across different sectors of interest, and now we're also hosting meetings in different locations on the coast. So, so we, we cross the state both ways, if you wish, to try to get everybody's concern, to get everybody to better understand what it is, what it's about, what it's for so that there's no surprise that arises in the end. And I also want to push the video series. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned that, but we developed a video series for this. Um, really, just to go to the website and take a look at those six videos, well, the five others, because you just saw the intro, it was a, a quick one. But the other five videos address the ecological significance of the sound, and also you know, the four um, human use categories of recreation, marine transportation, uh, commercial fishing, um, and there's one more that is uh, escaping historic me. Cultural. Uh, historic. Cultural and historic um, features. You know, those, the, the videos interview um, tribal <coughs> leaders and uh, advisory committee members and people who will be affected by the plan, um, whose businesses <coughs> will be affected by the plan, and they are better spokespeople than any of us could ever be in terms of trying to um, explain what the plan will mean for their businesses, what the sound means to them, what, what they think is important, and how the blue plan is actually going to benefit um, each of those you know, particular sectors. So, um, and they're beautifully produced. The Middlesex Community College did a terrific job. Um, so I, I highly recommend that everybody you know, go take a look at them. They're five to seven minutes long. Um, you know, easy to digest and just really, really beautifully done. And they're on what website? Uh, it's, you can get them through the Blue Plan website. If you just Google Blue Plan videos, it should pop up. But if, if there is a shortcut, uh, LIS Blue Plan videos. Um, once you get onto the DEP website. That website on the bottom will take you there.
Um, I know you've had your hand up in the back for a while. Watch the video, I might be able to answer my own question. And I don't know if you can read the screen from back there, but the uh, the very first one is areas associated with lighthouses and other historic areas. Okay, okay. That, I, my, my other half is uh, part of the uh, Trust for Historic Preservation, so I just want to feed that back. And the second question was, uh, is a little broader. Commissioner Cleek came here and spoke at this library last year, and a lot of the talk was about Long Island Sound, and he talked about the changes and the, the change of the sea level rise in, in the next 10 to 20 to 30 years right here, you know, obviously along the coast, certainly down here. Um, and he talked about um, new species, blue crabs, things that didn't used to exist here that are here, and other species that may be moving away um, as water temperature changes. But how, how is the planning and the modeling, obviously if you're changing, if you're updating every five years or something, how are you taking into consideration that that level of rapid change that's, that's <laughs> happening now and would affect permitting processes probably if you're planning out over a period of time? Right, so the question was how are we accounting for some of the occasionally rapid changes we see in Long Island Sound um, within that five year mandatory update period? Um, so one of the answers is that we're, this is gonna be I guess one of my personal answers is that I really like to throw it back to the people of Connecticut to say, you know, this, this is your blue plan. There is a public hearing every year for DEEP to report out on this and also to hear. Um, so if you, you see something in the plan that needs to be changed and you think that the agencies are missing this, bring it to their attention. That's, again, one of the hallmarks of this process is we're listening. We want to hear this. We want to know what you know and incorporate it to make a better, better document. So if we don't catch it, if DEEP doesn't catch it in their work going forward, bring it to their attention actively. And I would encourage anyone to do that. Yeah. I just wanted to say when, when you were talking about um, trying to take away people's fears about something like this that you absolutely have. <laughs> I came tonight. I live on the water. I've lived here for 75 years. And it's very dear to me. And I thought, what are they going to do? Oh, wonderful thing. I compliment all of you. I think it's just grand what you're doing. Great. And, you know, I approve of it 100%. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Appreciate, Thank you. appreciate it. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I know you've had your hand up for a while. Sorry. Well, you just spoke to it, but I'd like you to just clarify it for me. You, you mentioned the five year review, and I think I had written down the annual review. Thank you for the public opportunity to hear the plan and to speak to the plan. Are those review periods, can you explain the five year and the one year again, and are those also public comment opportunities for changes if this plan gets approved? Yeah, so to, your, to answer your second question first, yes, they are all public. Um, the, the plan is manda mandated to undergo a review every five years okay. and also to report back out once in a public hearing once annually. Um, I don't know if the guys at DEEP are going to understand that that mechanism better than me want to comment on that at all. That, that is the, the outer limit. We can always add new data to the data viewer when we get it, and that's our intention. Um, but it's, it's kind of unusual that the legislation would build in that ongoing process. So it's clear the legislature intended for us to keep using this and for it to be a living document and not just we're done put it on the shelf and maybe we'll look at it maybe we won't but we will we expect to it will never be finished ever it will continue to live in a, in an evolve and, and one of the components of that is to continue to think about emerging issues that maybe we're not quite aware of what's going on right now but you know, there, there could be things that happen with respect to climate change that we can't foresee right now, but that's a part of the, the overall long-term planning process is to try to identify additional emerging issues as they emerge. All right, I just got a time warning from the library, so we'll take two more questions. Roger. Roger Frank, Chairman of the President of Sound. 
I think the plan is great. You mentioned shellfish, and I know from Mississippi East you talked about the territory of lobster fish, but you don't say anything in here about lobster fish at all. About you know, hundred million dollar industry, that hundred fifty fishermen are bankrupt, and there's no senator not there, Dr. Lance Stewart from Yukon. There's no soundskeeper Terry Backer around that really fought for the sound. I mean, God Hunter made eighty percent of all in the last forty five years when he's by Lance Stewart. Started the log book. That was the first guy to think about in 74. It's like without those people, it's all forgotten. We're talking about clamming, oyster, but the most valuable piece of property out there, species out there, was lots of fish. We're still hanging in there. My wife's probably been there 15,000 meetings since 1999, since what's the house started. And it's like they're all retired with their pensions, very back with uh, the fisheries. Uh, Simpson, Eric Smith, guys that fought for it. Lance was ahead of the B notch program. We threw 85 lobsters back in the sound. We watched after the spring, we watched them running and dying, killing the, you know, killing the uh, oxygen level. The water clearing up, everyone's saying it's fluid. You know, before Senator Gunther died, he called me up to his house and he said, Remember this, Roger. They're all saying it sounds fluid. You know yourself, it's cleaner. It's been, but I started fishing since the, uh, really the 50s when I was nine years old. It's cleaner as ever been, but remember this, the biggest fight you have for the fishermen and for Long Island Sound is to compare Long Island Sound, when they say it's polluted, to Rhode Island and Newport. What happened there when they used one chemical and the thing for the West Nile? They ran 35 miles out in one week, they ran 100 miles out in two weeks, all the offshore towns. Now all those guys are fine, but, you know, all the regulations were overfished, uh, up the gauge, limited the traps, limited the license. So when everyone says the sound is fluid, it's cleaner than it's ever been. And it's a chemical kill with the god darn sewer treatment, you know? When the market that's no in the meetings, left and right. He said warm water. Who checks warm water? He said uh, DEP, uh, not DEP, agriculture. He says it's like all day long. How much warmer is it now? What are we talking about? I don't really check the warm water. I check once a week. It's maybe a half degree, what do we see from years ago? Norman Boone has a probe at 205 foot of water for Aiden's neck. That was one of our best lobster territories. It was cooler there about three years ago we had that than it was 20 years ago. So I'm just wondering, could this plan, which is great what you're doing, could it get back into that somewhat? So our kids, our grandkids, think we can have a life that we have. We love it. Yeah, no, I, I hear you, Roger. You know, the way it's just like, we worked hard at this thing. I started the first analysis for it as a uh, fishery. It's first commercial. Kay Wins from Captain's Gold Black, one of his best friends, was the first president. I was the only fisherman in 74 to take the state up. That was Dr. Lance Stewart from Yukon to make a log boat. So this day would never happen. It's 20 years we're fighting. And I see this thing is great. It's all commercial fishermen, but not one word lobster. Yeah. I'm just the geese was head of the lawsuit. But I'm one of the smallest guys in the lawsuit, so, you know? $50 million loss. So, so, Roger, look at there's, there's not, uh, Lobsterman is, is not on every page, but every every other example that came in tonight is about uh, fishing, commercial, commercial fishing. Right. That's, that's, that's a big sector. It's big economically. It's big culturally. I see it's, 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 it's important. Yeah. It's, been, it's been highlighted way out more than anything else in the group. But I can, now we cannot, we cannot go backwards. We cannot go backwards, but well, we can go forward. I see deeper. I don't know anyone anymore. We work nine o'clock. And I just don't see anyone mention that word. You know, hundred million dollar industry. And I don't know. Should be at it. Should be at it. I'll give you one example where in the ecological, yeah. the ESA's the ecological significant areas, one of the many layers that you didn't see tonight is what we call lobster refugia. There's a study that was done that, and that analyzed Long Island Sound for where with climate changes, which are going to be the best places Could you for speak lobster. Up a bit? I can't. Yeah, I'm just saying that one, one of the layers you didn't see in the ecologically significant areas pertains to lobster, specifically for lobster, and it's it's a study that tried to predict the best places in Long Island Sound 
where the lobsters are going to still survive with all the changes that are predicted to come with climate change. So it's just one thing, but it's an example of where lobsters you know, you know, we, identified. We, we and it's actually, out. a lot of it's in this area, actually. We went back and forth to Washington, not come there, and sat on the USA Speaking Fisheries for 40 years. Lance Silver sat there for 28 years. Lance is a doctor, he has a degree in dissecting all these animals in the sound. That's a uh, teacher at UConn, professor. They don't die from warm water, they run from it. There's no such thing as dying. Now we've had our tanks up to 80 degrees in our storm. It's only chemicals. Chemicals and sewer treatments, you know? Yeah, no, Roger, I hear you, but there's, but unfortunately, the plan can't handle anything water quality. To me, it's like, you know, we're getting money with it. There's stuff that we, people made a living since the 16th century. And I don't know what they can do, but I just don't want them to forget about it. Know it's wrong. Yeah. We won't forget about it. All right, one more question. Um, I'd just like take to make, you. Make, make a comment about the public trust. Um, I served on the Harbor Management Commission in Greenwich, and I'm on the Conservation Commission in, in Greenwich, and public trust has come up in both of those areas. Uh, in your summary, you mentioned the public trust in the state of New York and the state of Connecticut. You left out the federal. Federal has, has uh, um, na navigation projects, Federal harbors of refuge, federal uh, boating ramps, and so forth. Um, so the the public trusts are in essence administered by trustees, and trustees have a fiduciary duty to administer it in, 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 in a proper manner. Insofar as the uh, water companies and the uh, water plan for the state, uh, what was happening and what what we were seeing in in Greenwich is that people who are on well said, well, the well is on, on my property, I'm just gonna dig down and take out as much water as I want. But the fact of the matter is that the aquifers do not stop at the property line. Right. They are a public trust, and they flow throughout, uh, whether it's com coming to, to light in, in a river or a stream, or going underground in an aquifer and, and being part of the well. Okay, thanks. All right, I'm getting the, we gotta shut it down. Yeah. So thank you so much everyone for coming out tonight and hanging in there.